Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Yaqeen Institute podcast. My name is Mahin Islam and today I'm joined by brother Asadullah Ali Al-Andalusi. Al-Andalusi, right? Uh, who was talking yeah. about his paper, The Structure of Scientific Productivity in Islamic Civilization, Orientalist Fables. So, Asadullah, uh, welcome. You're calling in all the way from Malaysia and we're in Chicago. It's probably like middle of the night there and everything in Ramadan. So, appreciate you uh, staying up with us today. Yeah, no problem. First, I'd like to say, you know, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Ramadan Mubarak, and jazakallah khair for having me on your show. Um, and yeah, it is, it is quite late right now, but that's the consequence of being on the other side of the world, literally. So, right, right, for sure, for sure. So, before we get into your paper, I wanted to kind of, um, get an understanding of, real briefly, just give us a 30 second overview of your background and why you decided to work with Yucky Institute, which for our listeners out, you know, people are, have obviously seen it on, on social media and it's, it's a newly launched institution, but, uh, the Shuk Omar Suleiman's running, it's a think tank. Uh, how do you how does how does you and your background uh, fit into what Yakin's trying to do? Uh, well, uh, firstly, um, I'm a revert to Islam, so I'm still relatively new to the faith. However, my academic background is in Western philosophy, Islamic philosophy, and now I'm doing a PhD uh, candidacy in uh, Islamic studies. So uh, my where I kind of fit in Yakin Institute is that I analyze. Um, Western ideologies, or what we call Occidental ideologies, and um, I kind of examine how how it how it interacts, how those ideologies react or interact with the Muslim world and Muslim ideologies and in, in our history, and I also deconstruct those ideas to see you know if there are any sort of biases uh, holding us back. Uh, for example, like Orientalism. So. I see. Now, Occidental is synonymous with Western uh, yes, civilization, more or less. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the formal term for for the West. Uh, of course, Orient is the formal term for the East. So, now, well, why this paper specifically? As I know, you're probably going to have a lot of papers for Yakin based upon your background. But why this paper on the? Uh, I guess the the whole science science. I guess we, where we produce science, and now we're more consumers of science. I think that's the theme of it, but. Uh, and then also the attack of Orientalists on why the Muslim world isn't necessarily, you know, leading the way in science anymore. It, um, but w why did you kind of want to cover this subject to start off with? Well, first off, I mean, I've always been interested in history and the philosophy, uh, you know, of science and um, uh, the history of science in particular. So that that general um, interest is what kind of led me down this path. And, and also because the answer, uh, and there hasn't been any answers to this problem of why the Muslim world declined in scientific productivity. I mean, there have been, but they've been generally very um, obscure or biased in favor of, of, you know, of Western prejudices against, against Muslims and the East in general. So this was my main motivation for tackling this problem. And, um, and, you know, I, I've been kind of thinking about it for quite some time, uh, even prior to becoming a Muslim, actually. OK. You know, it's interesting because when I when I was reading your paper and I've always assumed that Islam, as far as um, PR goes, as far as the general conception amongst the average Muslim layman is that Islam is a pretty pro-science religion or is compatible with science. Um, unlike the rep, the uh, rap that Christianity seems to get, Christianity seems to have this very anti-science slant. So it was kind of surprising to see that um, this is something that the Orientalists were going after. But at the same time, it made sense because the whole, the rhetoric today against again in the PR campaign against Muslims, which, if I may clarify, a lot of it is on to our own doing. Doing we have like these neo kharijite groups doing like doing something crazy every week now it seems like right so that's not really you know that's not really helping our case but at the same time people are like jumping on this bandwagon well because they're saying like well there's a it's a savage civilization they can't they certainly can't be cutting edge on anything right on science science being one thing right so i thought that's maybe why one of the reasons um why the orientalists may have come uh, um at, coming after islam at this angle just to kind of cut off any angle of credibility that 
a, a neutral person might look at Islam with. Um, have you found that to be the case, and or have you even thought about that in, in your analysis? Well, yeah, I mean, actually, this sort of bias, this sort of perception of Islam happened a, uh, quite a few centuries prior to, to contemporary events. I mean, uh, when we look at, like, the rise of French colonialism, you know, um, and the rise of colonialism in general, uh, there was a there was a perception of, uh, of science in relation to European societies, which were were starting to become more progressive in technology and in science, especially in terms of warfare. There, there's a perception of science that it's about power and control. Um, so, in the same way, they viewed other societies uh, as less than them if they could conquer them. Okay, so Orientalists have had a uh, have, have a long tradition of looking down on the Muslim world, uh, even prior to, you know, recent events with the Khawarij, you know, and terrorism and things like this, which, by the way, you know, it, it is a product of instability. It, it's not a cause of it. Um, if we look at the, the history of the Khawarij, you know, we notice that they usually come out of periods of instability and chaos. So, um, yeah, I mean, Orientalists have been looking at the Muslim world as degenerate, uh, as as declining for quite some time, and with uh, with some deal of uh, truth behind their claims, even though it, it's heavily biased, they, they did notice that there's decline there, and even Muslims themselves noticed there was decline. So uh, it is, in many respects, our fault. Um, it, it's not just a bias that they have that comes out of thin air, but yeah, th- there is a lot of fault on our, on our end. Right. Now, as we walk through your paper, um, and you start off talking about how the Orientalists came after uh, Imam al-Ghazali, which is interesting the first, when I first saw that because Imam al-Ghazali is someone who his supporters in the Muslim community prop him up as someone who is a like essentially a sign of pluralism and intellectual thought and rigor, and he's the guy they come after. And it sounds like it's from the angle of, well, he refuted the philosophers, right? He wrote this book called The Incoherence of the Philosophers, um, and that they equate, you know, philosophy from their sense, the Greek philosophy of Aristotle um, and et cetera, as being, like, technologically advanced for that age. And the fact that he would reject that indicates that, well, he's not about any kind of advancement. Is that an, ac- is that an accurate portrayal of what their argument kind of starts off with? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty accurate assessment because they, the Western world, the Occident in general, um, sort of traces its own intellectual history back to Aristotle. So they presume there's sort of this progressive um, uh, nature of, of, of their intellectual history from Aristotle all the way to the current time period. Um, they don't seem to realize uh, when they project this myth that in order for them to progress – during, for instance, the Enlightenment period, they had to reject Aristotelian philosophy, which they did, and they replaced it with um, the thoughts of um, René Descartes, um, otherwise known as Cartesianism today. Um, so, but when it comes to examining the Muslim world, you know, they they project upon uh, the Muslims this, you know, this myth that oh well, you know, you rejected our awesome intellectual history, therefore that's why you declined. Uh, but that's not the case at all. Um, in fact, what Al-Ghazali did effectively was simply uh, return back to how the early Muslims treated Aristotle. Um, many people don't seem to understand this, but Aristotle was not revered to the extent where everything that was read from him was taken as absolute truth. Uh, one of the main reasons that Muslims progressed so quickly in the sciences is because they modified and even rejected many of Aristotle's doctrines, especially in natural philosophy. Um, it wasn't until later uh, that the Muslims stopped doing this uh, that uh, we started to actually uh, decline. Yeah. And it's funny. You mentioned Ren- Rene Descartes. I actually was listening to uh, a, an Akita series the other day, and the speaker was talking about that Descartes was pretty well known for plagiarizing Al-Ghazali. Uh, I don't know if you, <laughs> if, if you had come across that, as, if you had arrived to any similar conclusions. Uh, I, I haven't. I'm not very familiar with um, with that accusation, actually. I mean, I think I've heard of it, but I, I don't think... If you actually read Descartes, um, many of his opinions, especially on causality, don't even come close to Al-Ghazali. I mean, Al-Ghazali was an occasionalist, meaning that he, he believed that everything was directly caused by Allah. 
whereas Descartes held to a very machine-like interpretation of causality. I mean, he actually believed causes were intrinsic to the objects themselves. Um, so uh, in that sense, I, I wouldn't say he plagiarized Al-Ghazali. Maybe in another way, but I'm not familiar. So. Yeah, I think what I what I heard was that when they had um, gone through his library after his death, that he had copies of many of Al-Ghazali's works, and they they were marked up, highlighted, and even referenced, saying that like we're gonna like use this, we're gonna use this, like that was written the footnotes, and we're gonna use this for this paper or this kind of research, etc. So that's kind of where. Um, cause I've heard other philosophers have also, Western philosophers have quoted Al-Ghazali, but they, they cite him. Whereas the, the accusation was that Descartes used them, but, uh, you know, maybe not on every point, like, like the one you just alluded to. Um, l- let's, let's define science first. L- cause I think that, that's the whole, that, like, oh, wow. before we get into that, let's, let's define science you have in the paper. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you, what you mean by that so we can kind of get on the same page. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, first off, I just want to say that, the the analysis that I gave on science in the beginning paper was really supposed to be just very basic, very general, because that discussion in and of itself could probably last a couple of podcasts. Um, however, the conception of science that I did try to give off uh, is one that I consider to be the most accurate and the most coherent uh, in the contemporary period, is that science is really about constructing theories um, in the best way possible to interpret the information around us or, or what we experience. Uh, now, th- among the lay people, among you know, normal people in society, we're, we're kind of fed this idea that science is, is this absolute um, you know, way of truth, that all we have to do is look at the world and we know exactly what's going on, right? So all the theories that we currently have are exact representations of how the world works, Okay. But in fact, that's that's actually not the case. Um, uh, throughout history, uh, for instance, with the uh, especially like in astronomy, um, uh, scholars, scientists have have been constructing theories uh, to best interpret the data that they have. Uh, so when we talk about the Ptolemaic system, for instance, when we believe that um, the sun and all the other planets rotated around the Earth, right? Now, of course, today we consider that erroneous. We consider that wrong, right? But uh, before, uh, they made some very accurate predictions uh, with that theory. I mean, they, they were able to, to map the stars and to, and, to, and to understand how the world worked or how the universe worked uh, to a pretty good degree. Um, it wasn't until they started to experience what we call anomalies or these sort of um, unexpected events, unexpected uh, uh, sort of uh, phenomena that – that the theory became unstable. And then, of course, eventually uh, Copernicus would solve the problem by instead of putting the Earth in the center, he put the sun in the center. But here's the thing that people don't realize. Copernicus didn't find he didn't he didn't see the sun in the middle of our galaxy. You know, he didn't he didn't observe that. He just thought about it as a way to solve the mathematical issues that the Ptolemaic system had. And, and some of the uh, the erratic phenomena that were occurring. The Ptolemaic. You know, what's the Ptolemaic system? Uh, it was the or the geocentric system. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, that was uh, formulated by Ptolemy. That that basically uh, the Earth is center of the world. Is that what that is? Yeah, basically the center of the universe, and that everything rotates around it. And there's a lot of other um, uh, views within that as well. Like for instance, that the the Earth is stationary; it doesn't move, right? But um, you know, Copernicus kids came along. He, he didn't get into a rocket ship or anything, right? Because they didn't exist back then. He didn't go and see the sun in, in the center of the galaxy and then, and then you know, observe from that that that's the correct way of understanding the universe. He didn't do that. What he did was that he just simply thought about a solution that could solve all of these anomalies. And so when he put the sun in the center and it solved all of these problems that the Ptolemaic system was having with the eclipses, etc., uh, we only then later found that this was actually correct. But the reason that it was followed and that it was considered to be accurate was because it was more coherent. And in fact, that's how science has kind of evolved over time. It it, it hasn't been because of direct observations that we form our theories. Rather, we form our theories to understand the observations. Does that make sense? Or do I need to break that down? Let's break it down a little bit more, but I think it's if I can, well, let me let me let me try to inter, let me try to summarize it. And if I'm off, you can 
it's basically it's okay, like the whole I'll thing of your, you've got this um so you, you've got this uh like a square you're trying to almost fit like a square peg into a circle and you mold the circle to make it i don't know that's the that's kind of how i would approach it or if you're if we're talking to Muslims, right? You let's let let's let, let's say you fo- you're following like a school, and I'm not going to be partial to the whole mud pro anti mud thing, but our listeners here probably know a little bit about it. It's like you're trying to fit your like the, the textual evidence to tail to the school of thought that you want to you know follow. Okay, yeah, I mean you you tailor it. That's a, it's a little bit different from what I'm trying to explain. So how about we put it this way? Okay, say that you experience um, or that you're a lawyer, right, or you're a detective. That's better, detective. So you come upon all this evidence, right, and you have to look at all this evidence, and it looks like a chaotic just bunch, just a bundle of stuff, right? Now, what your job is to do is to take that and try to make it organized, right, try to organize it in a way that it makes sense, that you can tell a story about it, that you can communicate to other people, right? You don't observe the evidence and then something just pops into your head. You know, you don't, you don't derive the explanation from what you observe. You, as you're observing, you're forming the explanation in your head to organize all these things, to make them all fit together in a coherent fashion, in a logical way, right? Right, right. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. so you don't just like, oh, I see all this evidence now, boom, okay, he did it. You know, no, you have to actually find uh, how all of these things fit together in a pu- like a puzzle? You're, you're trying and, to tell. A st- okay, I, I see what you're saying because it, you know, maybe for listeners out there, if they're familiar with the O.J. Simpson case, like, it reminds me of that, right? Where they have all this evidence, they're like trying to. F- there's gaps in evidence, so they're trying yeah. to, but they're trying to like connect the dots when there aren't all the pieces there, right? Is that exactly. what it is? You're trying, but you're trying to tell the story is the main point. Is the yeah? Main, because the thing about it is that you have to understand is that. Uh, to contemporary philosophers of science, we've all recognized finally that human beings obviously can't know everything and we can't observe everything. Even, even the things that we talk about the universe today, like with quantum physics, we don't actually see that stuff. You know, all we're doing is taking the data that we have in front of us and trying to make it uh, coherent or otherwise understandable um, and non-contradictory, something that can be used to explain future events and really, that's how science has progressed throughout history. You know, you know, we look back at, in time and we look at the Ptolemaic system, the geocentric system, and we think, oh, our ancestors must have been stupid. No, they weren't stupid. They just didn't have the necessary data to make the changes that we did or that our, you know, that future uh, scientists did. You know, but with what they had, the, the, the geocentric theory was brilliant. I mean, it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, if you actually look back how complex it was and, and what it did and, and how practical it was, and the practicalities um, that were derived from it. And then you know, when Copernicus came along, we think that just magically he just came up with something new, you know, because of something he observed. But that's not what happened. He, he was just trying to solve a, a problem. You know, he was just trying to solve uh, where the next piece of the puzzle went. You know, and then eventually he just found out, well, the puzzle's not formed correctly. You know, something's wrong. This piece should be over here. This piece should be over here. And then, you know, now we have the system that we have today, um, the heliocentric system. Right. And that's really how science has developed over time. So th- this idea that we're given today that, um, you know, scientists just go out or go to their labs or, you know, they look through a telescope and then all of a sudden, you know, it just the theory just kind of pops in their head because of what they observe. That's nonsense. With that being said, talk to us a little bit about um, you, you talk about in the paper about we, Islam and science. There's this age of productivity and then there's an age of dependency. Uh, with the age of productivity preceding the age of dependency. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, how the timeline of the age of productivity, how it kind of came about. Uh, we, I know we alluded to a little hints here and there already, but maybe take us through the whole, the whole timeline in a, in a short span if you can. Okay. Well, I'll just make it brief. Um, basically what happened was that as the, as the Muslim empire was forming, right, and, um, getting in contact with its neighbors, the Byzantines and the, and the Persians, um, it had to become resourceful. It had to become pragmatic in many in many ways in order to compete with these uh, other civilizations as well as organize itself. Right? Um, you know, when you now you have a new government, you have a new nation. You know, you have to find ways to organize yourself and and to and to keep uh, stability. Right? And also to be more powerful than your neighbors. 
because, you know, you're always under constant threat of being invaded by somebody else, especially in a time of empires. So the first thing that that many governors and, and just Muslim politicians in general had in mind during that time or during the classical period was, well, how do we, you know, one up our neighbors? How do, how do we overcome our own um, our own disadvantages? So uh, what happened, the first thing that actually happened was, well, we want to become independent from, say, the Byzantine and Persian empires in terms of our economy. Because if your economy is still being controlled by your enemies, well, that's not going to help you very much. So uh, the first thing that Muslim society do was, well, we need to make our own currency, our own coins, right? Something that we can develop ourselves. So um, uh, they decided that the best way to make our own coins was to find out um, uh, what the science was to make those coins. And of course, back then it was alchemy or mixing metals. Right. So uh, the first works that were translated from from the Greeks was um, uh, books on alchemy. Uh, and from here, uh, the Muslim uh, empire uh, decided that uh, it would also be good to learn how to make uh, different weapons and uh, how to basically be independent from these from from their enemies. Um, and one of the more interesting things about how, how these translations sort of kind of became initiated was that when the first books of alchemy were created and the coins were, were first formed, right, um, the tax collectors, right, people who had to collect these coins and um, those who knew how to make them, etc., not only did they have to learn alchemy, but they had to learn other subjects as well from the Greeks. So, for example, they had to learn about weights and measures. They had to learn about mathematics in order to, you know, properly calculate those taxes, uh, they had to learn about land surveying and things like this to, you know, to, to properly be able to to measure, you know, how much had to be charged, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it kind of had like this avalanche effect that, well, OK, now we know how to make coins, but now we have to do this. So now we have to do this and now we have to do this in order for the, the policy to function properly. So actually, a lot of these scientific works were translated primarily just so they could run the government and so they become independent from their neighbors. And that was when the age of productivity began, this sort of instrumentalist, very pragmatic approach towards science as a tool just to, to survive and to function as a society. Because, you know, prior to Islam, you know, the Arabs were, were, were disunited. You know, they, they did their own little thing in their tribes. They didn't really need all of this stuff. And they weren't really threatened by the neighboring empires that much because, you know, who wanted to conquer Arabia? There was really nothing there or uh, anything of, of any value, um, uh, you know, even the human capital wasn't, wasn't anything to, to, to be proud about because they weren't very learned in anything. They couldn't help you know, teach or, or um, give to the sciences. But now, now that they're united and, and had concerns um, about uh, these neighboring empires, they had to do these things. So they forced themselves to learn these sciences simply for the sake of survival. Uh, and that's when the age of productivity began and flourished uh, well into the 16th and 17th century. Right. And I think I, if I recall, the, the, the ulama, the scholars, um, they were proponents of sci using science as a tool for practical like uh, concepts. Right. Like, for example, having the government function properly rather than having science yeah. just for the sake of learning something that couldn't be practically applied. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's nonsense anyway. I mean, no, no society in the world, even in today's age, tries to learn something just for the sake of learning it. I mean, we, we tell ourselves that because we want to feel special. But the thing is, most of the things that we learn are for material gain or for some sort of practical purpose. I mean, there are very few people in the world that just learn something just for the sake of learning it because uh, they just want to find the truth of something. And what I mean by that is like the Einsteins of the world, you know, the people who are, are office clerks and they just want to figure out the nature of the universe just for the heck of it. Um, very few scientists are like that. Even very few philosophers are like that. Uh, most of the time, the research projects that we work on even today are, are funded by, you know, either corporations or universities looking for some sort of material gain and not just money, but, you know, something that will be able to be sold or produced in the future or something that will give to back to society in a very practical uh, practical way. So um, this is not just the attitude of the early ulama, but it, it was the attitude of most 
scientists within any given civilization. So, okay. Now, this this Orientalist take on what happened with us with Islam and science in our tradition, they call it what the classical narrative, and that's that's a kind of a a word that's kind of like a monopoly. Like this, that's, like, that's the only <laughs> way to look at things. Um, yeah. It seems like well, to the victors goes the spoils, right? They they were able to coin it somehow and make it seem like that's the dogma. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, they didn't even coin it. The, the Orientalists didn't even coin this. The, their critics did because the Orientalists had such a monopoly on explaining science, you know, science and Islamic civilization. They didn't even have to name it. You know, <laughs> like it was just the common sense understanding of things. And the classical narrative is really um, is really a projection of the Western history with their own history with with religion and the church specifically, uh, which, by the way, is also kind of exaggerated as well. But that's for a different discussion. Um, but, yeah, basically, the, the whole mythos is that, well, because the church was opposed to science, like, you know, when they when they persecuted Galileo, that must mean the same thing existed in Islamic civilization. So it's not possible that Islamic conservatives or, you know, the the traditional scholars, for instance, could have been. Um, uh, advocates of scientific productivity. Uh, and it must be the case that science declined because of them. So all they did was really, after projecting this onto the Muslim world, they then tried to find evidences wherever they could that would conform this and confirm this understanding. Yeah, and it seemed like they tried to, like, you know, pin a lot of this, the success of Muslims and science on the the rule on the rise of the Mu'tazila. But if I recall, the Mu'tazila weren't in power for that long. And the, uh, the era of productivity and science for Islam both like started before the Mu'tazila and it came after. But for them, it, because the Mu'tazila's entire ideology was, okay, we like, it's ra- basically our, um, rationality over revelation. And, and that kind of mentality or mindset caters to the Western mind. And that's what they like. They, they don't want a tradition that, you know, says revelation first and then we use our rationality maybe to understand the revelation. It's rationality. It's, it's our reason first, reason, uh, more or less. So th- that's their pitch, right? If I understood correctly, like how they kind of explain how the Muslims, uh, did well in science. And then it said once, they, and then once they left, once they went back to revelation, once they went back to orthodoxy, then it all fell apart for them. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's how they do it. I mean, basically, they they tried to find the most, quote unquote, rationalist school they could in Islamic history. So instead of going back to the Umayyad period, which is when the the um, the age of productivity began, they jumped to the Abbasid period because that's where the Mutazila were. And uh, the Mutazila weren't actually in power, but they they were influential for a little over 30 years because um, uh, because uh, the Abbasid Caliphate had sort of established them as the leading, you know, um, theology of the time, but it was, it was a very meager period, you know. So what the Orientalists try to do is that they, they basically forget all of Islamic history prior to that period. And then they say, well, you see, the Mutazila established all the translations, they established all the learning and the science and, and all the rationality. And then after they, you know, fell out and after they were defeated by the Orthodox scholars, uh, then everything just went downhill from there. And of course, they blame Al-Ghazali for that. But that doesn't make any sense either because Al-Ghazali came, you know, um, much longer after after they were disposed of. So, uh, yeah, it's it's sort of like they're grasping for straws. Yeah, and I think they also want the Muslims to prop up figures like Ibn Sina. And if I and I, I think I'd heard this, is that Ibn Tay, scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and even Al-Ghazali considered Ibn Sina based upon his Akita, based upon his theology, that he wasn't even a Muslim. He was more like an atheist. He was a atheist philosopher. Maybe he, he had a, some kind of Muslim background. Can, but can you, because he comes up a lot as far as Islam and science because of his works in the medical field. Uh, can you clarify a little bit about who he was? I know I don't know if you really talked about that in the paper, but I'm sure a lot of the listeners uh, would be interested in knowing a little bit about Ibn Sina. Oh, Ibn Sina was... Uh considered probably the the head philosopher within Muslim civilization. Um, he was a Neoplatonic Aristotelian. Uh, it's a big, it's a mouthful, but uh, he basically tried to, com- to make a synthesis between Platonic Plato's ideas and Aristotle. Um, he 
he was considered to be the premier rationalist. But yes, um, according to figures like Al-Ghazali, he was not a Muslim. Um, he was a heretic. And um, However, um, even though that was the case, Al-Ghazali and others did not necessarily oppose everything that Ibn Sina said. So, for instance, they, they, they did adopt, for instance, Aristotelian logic, which they learned from Ibn Sina. And um, they, they took that from him as being something that was okay because it didn't oppose Islamic doctrine. Um, but what uh, Ibn Sina was known for was not simply philosophy but also medicine, like you mentioned. And his works were used all the way up to, I think, was it the 17th or 18th century? And uh, even by the Western world. Um, and he was influential even up through the Ottoman, uh, through the late Ottoman Empire. Uh, so he didn't actually die out after Al Ghazali tried to refute him. Um, uh, he was still uh, studied and learned in, in madrasa, uh, institutionalized madrasas in the Ottoman Empire uh, for a very, very, very long time. However, he was kind of limited because by the time Al Ghazali came around and, and, and went against him, and then you had the whole trend of the Ashari uh, theologians. Um, he was sort of tempered, like he was controlled. His ideas did not, um, the, the ideas that primarily went against Islamic doctrine were kind of uh, put on the reins. So uh, he was not as prolific. However, um, later down the line, when people like Al-Ghazali became less influential, uh, his ideas started to spring back to life. And uh, I th personally, I think that's why. Uh, Muslims began to decline again, or decline in in uh, in our history. And I, I know you have a this paper that we're discussing is part one of two, right? Yes. Uh, just as a preview, what what do you plan to cover in the next paper? Or if, I assume you've thought about it at some level. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm almost done writing it, so I hope so. <laughs> uh, I, um, basically, this paper was 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 written, the first part was written simply to kind of give a background, uh, to sort of wipe away um, all of these myths about what actually happened in our history, because I, I, in, I have to do that first before even giving my theory on decline. And um, as for the second paper, my theory is quite novel. Um, I'm still testing it against the works of other academics, but it seems to me, it seems to me, uh, from what I've gathered so far, that there are two main factors which really led to decline. Now, a lot of people like to focus on the external things like the, the sacking of, of, of Baghdad and, and the fall of Al-Andalus. And these are all very important factors, but they don't really tell what happened because external factors are, are really things that we can't control, mostly at least. And how we react to those external factors is really what determines our destiny, right? So I wanted to see what Muslims were thinking during this period. And what I found was it was actually quite alarming, um, alarming to me because I didn't expect it. And at the same time, it, it's not what we've been told. Remember, as I said before, the Orientalists sort of peddled this idea that religious conservatism was the reason behind the decline. But in fact, it, it, it's quite the opposite, uh, because what we find around the 16th and 17th century are many scholars and biographers complaining about the rise of philosophy in the Muslim world. And what I mean by philosophy is they're specifically talking about um, sort of not not Ibn Sina's philosophy necessarily. Avicinism was, was still uh, very prominent, but um, many of ideas of Aristotle that were previously rejected, like astrology, for instance, uh, we find that astrology is becoming more popular again within the Muslim world by the 17th century, which is very strange. Um, we, even, we even find some biographers complaining that some of the faqis, some of the even the, the qadis in, in the court system, right? They, they even said that they no longer judge by the Quran and Sunnah, but they judge by you know logical deductions according to Aristotle. Which you know when you read that you're like, wow, you know what's going on here? Because this this period where where it seems like these scholars are complaining about philosophy becoming uh, more prominent coincides exactly at the same time with when the age of decline was was just starting okay so you're thinking well how is it possible that you know everyone's getting more rational apparently right but at the same time science is going downhill <laughs> what's going on 
Well, what we find is that also around the same time, Europe is starting to reject Aristotelian natural philosophy and starting to adopt uh, Cartesianism, um, rejecting Aristotle's old doctrines. Well, Cartesianism is Cartesianism. What's how do you define that? Oh, it's just uh, Rene Descartes. Uh, oh, okay, it's Descartes. Philosophy. Okay. So modern, we call, we consider Rene Descartes to be the father of, of contemporary or modern philosophy. So, so they they call it Cartesianism. And this was like, you know, this was the main influence behind the Enlightenment, etc. So um, uh, we find something else happening as well. Um, we find that, or at least I found that uh, the Tafasir tradition, um, the, exegesis, the exegesis of the Quran, also starts to change a little bit as well during this period of time. And it starts to implement um, scientific discoveries into the text. Not as not as a supplementary, but m- more so as being almost equal to revelation itself. Um, and why is this significant? Well, okay. Well, first off, if you start to uh, if you start to make supreme philosophy over revelation, that's that tells you one thing. It tells you well. First off, now they're starting to look at their the rational faculties as being as being supreme to to the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, even though they don't really say this openly, but this is this is basically what's what's being implied, and and at the same time they're saying that anything under that considered under philosophy, like the like those those sciences like astrology, etc., are also on the same level. Okay, so those are also uh, measurements of the Quran and the Sunnah. And then when you say that, and then you actually have legitimate works from scholars that are saying, well, this scientific discovery, like the Ptolemaic system, is exactly as the world is. You're absolutizing science. Remember, that that's a problem because when you do that, then you can't change it, right? If you say that science is in the Quran, this science that we're here that we know about is in the Quran, it's equivalent to this ayah, then what you're saying is it can't change because the Quran can't change, right? So what I found was that um, it seems to me that there was a form of like positivism almost going on, and, and that's a that's a contemporary belief that uh, science is, is somewhat like the measure of all things, you know. Right, right, okay, for sure, for sure. Is there anything on else on the current paper that you'd want the listeners uh, to be aware of? Obviously, for the listeners out there, the paper's available yakiinstitute.org. Uh, go under the research tab. It's I believe it's under publications. Um, and then yeah. the title again is a structure of scientific productive and Islamic civilization. But for anyone who's too lazy to read the paper, is there anything else you want to cover uh, yeah. on the show about uh, that may a, a takeaway that maybe we haven't talked about yet? Okay, well, I, I'd like to to say that one probably the biggest the, the general to, to sort of summarize everything is that the reason that we lost our productivity is because we're no longer adhering to our own values. Um, every civilization has a value structure, has a particular belief system about the world, about how the universe has to work. And the more that we conform to the Western perception of the reality, the secular perception of reality, the humanistic perception of reality, the more that we will not, no longer be able be able to understand things from an Islamic perspective, obviously. I mean, if we want Islamic science, for instance, the Islamic perception of science, the productivity of science within an Islamic framework to revive, you know, we have to stop borrowing from the dominant civilization. Um, so that's something I, I would hope that people will take away from this article uh, because we have a lot of problems today in the Muslim world, not just in terms of technology and science, but also you know ethically as well, where we continue to rely on Western modes of thought in order to solve those problems. And they're not working because we... we we simultaneously identify with a civilization that has that does not think on that same wavelength. So it's sort of like a, what we call like what, like a, a sort of schizophrenia. Right. Exactly. Uh, before we wrap up, Asadullah, what's the best way for people to, uh, or what are the various means people can get in touch with you? I know you've got a YouTube channel. Tell us a little bit about that. And like, are you on Facebook, Twitter? If people want to engage <laughs> with any uh, any of your work. Uh, yeah, I'm everywhere. So I'm on Facebook. I'm on YouTube. Uh, you can find my uh, Facebook page, Andalusian Project. Um, and uh, yeah, I post most of my work there. Um, my Facebook is also posted there as well. And uh, my blog is asadullahaliyah.com. So if you want to find my articles, etc. But can you say that uh, one more time? 
asadullahali.com. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, my name. So. Okay, sounds good. That's A S A D U L L A H. Um, yeah. So, Jazakallah uh, Khair, Asadullah. We appreciate you coming on. Um, uh, for our listeners out there, like as I mentioned, you can check out this article at yakininstitute.org under research, and the title is The Structure of Scientific Productivity in Islamic Civilization Orientalist Fables. For our producer, Imran Munir, I'm your host, Mahin Islam, and for our guest, Asadullah Ali, uh, we'd like to thank everybody for listening, and this is the Yakin Institute Podcast. We're signing off. Assalamualaikum. alaikum.